Active Learning. Um, I'm also missing here, I hope they come inside, if you can call them, we have Jesus Morales. Everybody knows Jesus. Also Robert Rocha. Um, I'm trying not to forget Sharita Martin. From the Northeast, because I am from the Northeast too. I <laughs> also want to thank, um, who else am I missing? Earl Yeager, of course. Earl did a tremendous job making sure this uh, building is reserved. Also, Melissa Aguilar. Uh, I hope you know Melissa. Laura Salazar. They're coming in. Herman Seifert. There you go. Lorena Ariaga, facilitator active learning. Carolyn Moody, facilitator active learning as well. So, who am I missing, guys? Did I cover everybody? Yeah, I called. Yeah, so these are my children. Okay? So I'm their mother, Han, and their father, Han, is Chris. Okay? So we all work together as one team. So thank you very much for always, you know, believing in active learning department. That is our department, and our mission is to serve you guys. That's all there is. Okay? We are here to be of service to you so that you will be amazing teachers at your classrooms. All right. Okay, so let me go ahead and start introducing our wonderful keynote speaker. I met Kevin back in the early 2000s when I was an instructional technology spe uh, specialist at another district. Uh, he was the keynote speaker during a conference and his words of encouragement, positivity, and wisdom have motivated me to be intentional with my craft and expertise as I share with teachers how they can engage and inspire their own students. And now moving forward, I get to have the privilege to introduce him to all of you. You will be delighted to know that Kevin is no stranger to public school as a student and as a teacher. He grew up in poverty and attended in many cities across the United States. He witnessed education around the country, which he collected and used as powerful experiences to influence his conversations and his work with educators. He spent 13 years teaching art in K-12 and 17 years leading creative adventure camps for kids of all ages. Kevin is also multi-awarded, which included being a recipient of the Making It Happen Award, which is an inter internationally recognized award for educators and leaders in the field of ed tech integration for K-12 schools. Kevin was also selected to be in the Apple Distinguished Educator Class of 2011. Kevin has hosted a creative learning site called Art Snacks since 2000, and he has shared more than 150 10-minute drawing videos to support standards curriculum. He has been a technology integration specialist at SDAC since 2003. He has also developed online safety, anti-bullying, and cyberbullying curriculum, which he shares with parents, teachers, and students around the country. Kevin likes to bring his personal life experiences and a sense of humor and creativity to the mission of helping prepare 21st century learners. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in giving a warm and joyful welcome to our keynote speaker, Mr. Kevin Hunnigan. I've been looking forward to getting here all week. Uh, two days ago it was in Anchorage, yesterday it was in La Crosse, Wisconsin, and now I'm in El Paso. <laughs> the home of Chico's Tacos, and I'm, go I'm gonna get some Chico's Tacos while I'm here. Um, I call it Trailer Park Caviar. Um, okay, so I'm just gonna tell you some stories today. I'm gonna tell you who I really am. Um, so I spent most of my teaching tenure in a little town. I didn't think I was gonna live in a little town, I had lived all over the country because dad, whenever he broke the law, we moved. It was called the midnight run in my house. We would come home from school. Let's say I literally love your classroom. I love everything about your school, but I'm, I'm not going to be here tomorrow because dad's going to say midnight run. No one questions that. You get a trash bag. You put everything in one trash bag. That's your luggage. Anything that doesn't fit in the trash bag doesn't go. So honeycusts don't have heirlooms. We have whatever we could fit in the trash bag. And that's my life. And I'm not complaining. You know, I tell kids hard edges cleave diamonds, but not without pain. What I tell kids is don't waste paint, paint with it. So I've spent my life painting with the pain that was given to me and I've turned it into something else. I always tell kids the best way out of darkness is to make your own light. So I think that's just the beautiful thing that you get to share with people. So I've been working with a lot of kids in poverty lately. It seems like the mission is pulling me into that realm. And so I'm using all of these tools to tell these kids you can use this to 
to turn this into this. You can turn your pain into this. I tell kids, dance with your demons, but lead. Don't let them lead you, right? So, you know, I've got siblings who have demons and, and they didn't. They let the demons lead and they've been in, in and out of jail, in and out of prison. I'm the one that didn't go to jail. I've never been in jail. All right. Yes. But it's been close a few times. It's been close a few times. So I get out to Inman, Kansas, this very conservative Mennonite community, and I'm not from there. I'm from the trailer parks, you know? And suddenly I'm a teacher there, and I'm trying to act normal, but the kids spot you. They always spot you, you know? You're probably a life raft for somebody. But they see you, and they say, she's messed up, and somehow keeping a job. <laughs> Maybe I'll role model her, you know? So I love these crazy, crazy teachers. I never loved the beautiful, perfect teachers. And there's always some of those around, you know? I call them Susie Cream Cheese teachers. <laughs> They wore denim and wooden apples, you know? And now they pick teaching light because they saw a Norman Rockwell painting and they thought, I'll be a teacher. I'll wear denim and wooden apples. And, and, and I'll walk down the hall and the kids will follow me like little ducklings. It'll be so cute. I was more of an iguana, you know? So I don't look like her picture of the duckling, you know? So she don't know how to touch me. She don't know how to interface with me. She loves the little cute girl over here, but she's not going to interact with me. So I found the crazy teachers, the three-fingered shop teacher talking about bandsaw safety, you know? <laughs> that guy knows. The perfectly imperfect teachers. And we're living in times when we've got all these new tools, right? And we don't know how to use them exactly. And I love that. In fact, if you were great at every tool, I would tell you to pretend you weren't. You know what I mean? As an art teacher, I never drew well in front of kids, because what would they say if I draw really well? They'll say, right. So I draw terrible, and they go, Mr. Honeycat, I'm afraid you're gonna get fired. <laughs> You suck. <laughs> well, I'm not going to unwrap the presents for the kids. I need them to be better than me. That's what we do, right? So as we're role modeling the use of technology, I don't know how to use any of this for real. If I show you something cool today, a fifth grader set it up for me. I don't know how to do it. I'm a 12 o'clock flasher. That sounds bad. <laughs> Everything in my house is flashing 12 because I can't program it. What did you think I was talking about? I don't even want to know what you think I was talking about. So I come to Inman, Kansas, where I live in the old Taves house. And by the way, I paid off this house. And the first time you got to graduate and pay off a house, we, just, we didn't do that. We lived in trailers. We were the house where the police were there twice each week. Everyone in the neighborhood wants us to move. That's, that's my whole childhood, you know? But now I paid off a house in this little town. And it's always going to be the old Taves place because I'm an interloper because I'm not a Mennonite. And they'd say, well, you're an interloper. I'm like, okay, fine. The, t the town motto seems to be, judge first, lest you miss your chance. <laughs> I stuck though, I stuck because there were kids who needed me there. The trailer park kids needed me there. Then I ran for school board. Uh-huh, I don't get mad, I get elected. <laughs> so I did 10 years on that school board representing those families and those kids and those crazy teachers who do whatever it takes, you know? I've always thought I'd rather be fired for doing the right thing than keep a job knowing I'm not. So if you're that crazy teacher that's in the office more than the kids, because you're inventing new strategies every day without anyone telling you you can, because the kids are bleeding out. There's no time to get back to you in a Band-Aid. They're bleeding out, and we've got to connect with them, you know. We have to build relationships with them, because they don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. You know that, right? So that's the teachers I always loved. So 10 years on the school board here in this little town, Inman, Kansas. Now that's me and my wife, that's my first year of college. Please understand, honeycuts don't go to college. I'm the first honeycut in living memory to graduate high school. They thought I, I was all that. Like, you think you're all that? You think you're a smart professor, Kevin? They had a hard time with me because they thought I was all uppity. And I just want something different. I don't want to live in a trailer. I want my kids to have shoes. I'm tired of this life. I know how to live in crisis. Believe me. Believe me. You ever notice that some kids will burn their life down right in front of you and you're like, what are you doing? Why are you self-destructing? And I think I know why. They're comfortable in a fire, right? But if there's never a fire in your classroom, they have no superpowers. At home, they put out fires every night. But if it's wah, 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 they're dying. They're dying in there, right? How many days of school did you go to that you remember none of? Anybody? Say, what was that? What was that? Rigor? What was that? Punishment? Paying your dues? You get people, they're fans of rigor. We need more rigor. There should be more rigor in here. They hit the G hard. It's all this glottal stuff, right? Rigor. Grr. Grr. <laughs> they seem to like this word rigor. Like, it means pain, right? It should hurt, little missy. Hurt when I learned it, too. It's like anal surgery. Now suck it up. <laughs> Does it have to suck? I mean, what if it was fun? Yeah? Is that against the law? I've always had a hard time with this, you know? People don't like exceptions. Well, <laughs> that's me. So that's me and my wife. I, I knew the night I met her, I was going to marry her. I took her to a fancy restaurant. There we were at Denny's. <laughs> and I'm talking my line of bull. Please understand, kids from poverty, 
we got skills. School doesn't always appreciate our skills, but we got some skills. You know those kids that you have that come from hard places? They can talk. They can usually flat out talk, right? I just wish there was a device, maybe technology, that would hear you talk and then write it down for you. Oh, there is, yeah, it's called speech to text, right? So we have that now. So a kid could talk a paragraph, talk a book. I talked a book recently. It's on Amazon. You want my book? Go on Amazon and find it. It's called Midnight Run. I talked the whole book. You don't like my book? Where's your book? <laughs> then you can shut up, can't you? Because I got a book and you don't. Some people don't like us cheating. Talk a book, not enough rigor. Rigor, it sounds like a medieval word. Pillage, plunder, and rigor. <laughs> Add the word mortis to the end, you know exactly what I'm talking about, right? No more rigor. So people are gonna get mad because it always happens. But most good school innovation dies of domestic violence. Because people get scared. Kevin, cut this crap out. This was told to me in a faculty meeting. Cut this crap out or we're all gonna have to do it. I won't say his name, Russ Gehring, 585 <laughs> I'm like, Russ, is it our job to make it easy for us or is it our job to do anything it takes to get kids to graduate and have a future? What's our job here? So yes, I'm learning, I'm always learning, in front of kids. I tell them, if I like you, I'll tell you what to know, but I love you, I'm gonna teach you how to know. Now, that's different, right? And you all know how to. You ever been to the doctor, got diagnosed with something that made you nervous, and by midnight you're an expert on that malady? <laughs> and what did you do? Combination of things, right? Self-concern, technology, and time. And you can do anything you want. I want our kids to be like that. Hunter-gatherers of information. There are more honor students in China than there are students in America. More honor students in China than there are students in America. And I think our kids can take anyone. They can take on anyone if we unleash them. But if they're waiting for permission to pee, they're helpless, right? We can't do that. We've got to let them lead. And this is hard, I know. It's gonna be a mess, I know. It's how it's been since you started, right? Remember your first year teaching when you didn't even know what you didn't know? How many of you got out of college and started learning to teach? And you paid for that, by the way, <laughs> right? And that's the job, right? And so I just want us to keep going. Just keep going. Act like it's your first year again. Forget everything that you were ever afraid of and just do it. Jump in and role model. Hey, old people don't stop learning, children, right? Old Man Honeycut is still learning every day because you don't get to get a degree, work 30 years and get a guaranteed severance package and a gold watch anymore. You're as good as how fast you can relearn. I want kids to see me doing that. And I'm tired and I'm old, but I'm doing it. I take her to Denny's and I'm talking my line of bull and she looks across the table and she says, you do realize that I know you're full of crap, right? <laughs> I said, uh-oh, this girl's smart. I was, I was intrigued. Because I moved all the time. I moved so many times. I don't have a dialect. I have every dialect. Whoever I'm talking to, I become them. I, I chameleonize whoever I'm talking to. So I'm in London, I'm talking to this guy right, on, on, on the train, and I'm, suddenly I'm, I'm talking like I'm from there. He, he thinks I'm from there too. I'm New Zealand, I'm in, Nor I'm in Northern Territory, Australia, I'm talking like that, right? Because over there it's crazy. These people are crazy over there. Because right? there's 15,000 things that will kill you in Australia, right? <laughs> So there's posters in the faculty room. If this spider bites, you get straight to hospital. If this spider bites, you go straight to the cemetery. If this... That's not funny, right? I mean, right? I'm teaching in the outback, bringing iPads to Aboriginal kids, and they don't have doors on the classrooms. Any, any dingo can just walk in, and the guy said, Kevin, I'm Kevin over there. Kevin, uh, point of information, half the dingoes on the island will bite you, but half won't. How is that even helpful, you know? What do you even do with that information? So imagine I'm this kid from poverty, from welfare, from foster homes, and I'm in your class, and I do have skills. I can talk. In fact, there were some teachers who didn't like it. You need to shut up, Kevin. You talk too much, Kevin. Guess how I make a freaking living now? Ha, 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 ha. I'm also funny. I don't mean to be funny, but I'm funny because when you're from hard places, you either cry or you laugh. I chose to laugh. A lot of comedians you like probably came up hard, right? The kids can use the skill, but I had some teachers who said, you know, you're gonna be telling jokes in my room. This is my room. I tell jokes in here, said my teacher. My, by the way, my teacher is not even funny. It's not my fault, the man's not funny. I told a joke one day and he got really mad because everybody laughed, so he grabbed me by the neck, not the shirt, the neck. He picks me up out of my chair and I'm like, is this happening? Is this real? Is this happening? He's gonna get fired and then I realized, no he's not. He's done the math. My family don't come to parent-teacher conferences. He's gonna get away with this. Takes me out to the hallway so we can have some us time, me and him. He yells in my face, you're trying to get my goat, aren't you? Has anyone ever said something to you so old-fashioned and you don't even know what it means? I'm like, get your goat? I said, I don't know what's going on between you and this goat. And frankly, that's none of my business. The man lost his mind, picks me up, throws me in the floor, and screams at me, you don't matter! You will pump my gas. 
And he walked back in the room and left me laying in the hall and I just burned, I lay there and burned for a while. And then this thought came into my brain, I will prove him wrong. I spent the rest of my life doing that. I went off to college. I got learning disabilities. Can you tell I have ADHD? <laughs> I'm medicated. This is as good as it gets right here. I'm, I'm operational right now. What's it like to have ADHD? I want to talk about that a little bit. It's like having a TV on with 110 channels on at the same time and you don't have the remote. But it's not all bad news, actually. I can come up with ideas like nobody's business. But if you don't need me to, then I'm a problem in your class. Do you have a place for me? And if it's want, 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 sit and wait until I tell you I'm screwed. I'm gonna die in there. And some of you know exactly what I'm talking about because I can spot my sisters and brothers in any audience. I can go, yep, that's, mm -hmm, there's one, there's one, there's one. <laughs> Screaming over here. <laughs> I'm talking my line of bull. She says, you know, I know you're full of crap. I said, I'm gonna marry this girl. Because my dad said, Kevin, marry a smart girl. Take the family tree above ground. <laughs> well, it took me six years. I said, I, I proposed. Will you marry me? She said, we'll see. We'll see. <laughs> That's not yes, it's not no, we'll see. Six years of we'll see. She's test driving this, right? She knows, I watched my dad beat my mom. What am I likely to do? Not this boy, she took me in hand right away. She said, you ever hit me, I'll kill you in your sleep. And she smiled when she said it, you know? Like she was looking forward to it or something. Yeah. I never hit my wife, uh, but you can hurt people without hitting people, you know? My wife paid my bills. My wife danced with my demons. And if I live to be 100, I don't deserve my wife. And I'm just lucky that I know that. You know what I mean? I'm working on it. She'll say, I've been married to three men in our marriage. I like this one best. <laughs> That's how much evolution I had to make to get from here to here. You know what I mean? To not go to jail. So I know how to get out. Now, just because you know it doesn't mean kids will listen to you. You know how it is? You think, no, I can help kids because I did it. Now they think you're old. They disqualify you. You're an old man. That's how it was in the depression. <laughs> I'm not that old, man. I moved out to Inman, Kansas, and we had this little boy. That's my little unicorn. That's Benjamin Allen Honeycutt. He's different. I said, what do you want to be for Halloween? He said, exit sign. <laughs> Caught me off guard, you know. I had to make this costume. It lit up. I mean, he, he's the exit. And, and in my little town, this stands out. People notice. They notice. And once they notice, they notice, right? Small places kill big minds, you know? They all roll their eyes and say, that's that kid. And then from then on, his whole career, he's going to be judged like this. For what? what? For being creative? For being different? That's a, that's a shame, man. And that happens, right? When my unicorn comes to your class, I want you to sharpen his horn. Don't cut it off. Don't tell him it's wrong. If unicorns grow up, they become inventors, world changers. Einstein, Edison, right? Tesla, Steve Jobs. Or they learn to conform and they're cashiers. I want my kid to own the business, not work for a business, you know what I mean? So I want him to be that crazy person. He grows up and you know, I fight the school all the time. They want to cut off his horn. They want to cut off his horn, man. It's, us, it's for us to do. We have to fight. You know, in my class, things are weird. And I get a bad write-up, but that kid has a home in my room. I'd rather bend the system to match the kid than bend a kid to match a system, right? If that's what you do, we're going to be friends, right? I got in trouble. I took the, I took the whole class to the trailer park because Denise is skipping school again. She's skipping school. She's about to drop out. I know it. So I take the whole class without permission slips. That's me. We got no time. She's bleeding out. We all holding hands in front of her trailer singing, Kumbaya, Kumbaya, hey, Denise, come back to school. She opens the door and goes, Mr. Honeycutt. I'm called police. What are you doing in my yard, you crazy man? Get out of here. I said, I'm, I'm gonna be back every day. We can't have school without you anymore. Damn. She said, I'll be there in five minutes. She comes to school, wet hair, didn't miss one more day of school. And I got written up, because that's what happens, right? I'm okay, that's all right. So my kid goes off to college, becomes the one thing he said he would never be, a teacher. He joined the family business. Poverty, yay, poverty. He went to Kansas University, where it cost us $100,000. We had saved money, we're teachers, we did payroll deduction, you know, for, for, for years. We had saved between us $7,000. So we just need $93,000 more dollars, so he can make $30,000 a year. And we love him? Yeah. Well, we say in my house, caskets don't have luggage racks. Spend it while you're here. But I got a couple things I want to tell y'all. I want the world to know what you do. And I don't, I'm not going to say and brag. Let's brag about the kids. 
What if we did that, you know? Politicians are talking about us and they're getting it wrong. Would you agree? Yeah. Raise your hand if we have better stories than they do. Keep your hand up if I can easily find them online and stick it in their face. <laughs> what are we, secret geniuses? We have to get the word out there, man. Whatever that takes. See, for me, it's talking to my phone, just telling stories, how that fucking class, what happened when that girl really took off. Little journal to myself. Like, it's self-reflection, right? We can do that with a phone now. Put it on YouTube, make it a private channel. No one has to see it, it's just yours. And then one day maybe you turn it on so everyone can see it, so your grandkids will know why you taught. We're the first generation that can do that. They can say, great grandma was crazy. <laughs> she taught school and not the easy kids, you know? Or we could leave photographs with writing on the back. That's 1800s, right? So do this, I'm just, push it out there. Right? However you blog, however you share, put your story out there, because yours is as good as mine. When my son left, right, it was just me and my wife, and it got weird. Any of you at that point in your life where you're empty nesters, anyone? When my wife got weird, like I was like happy because I did my job. He got a job, spiked the ball in the end zone. Men are different than women. She got all like empty nest syndrome, starts collecting animals. <laughs> it was four dogs, three cats, a turtle, and a rabbit. And I'm like, I stole, ho, 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 ho. I know what you're doing. You're back filling the emotional hole left by the departure of our child. I understand. I'm enough. <laughs> Apparently, I'm not even close to enough. <laughs> so I got a strategy. I'll date her again. I'll act like we're dating again. I'll take her to concerts. REO Speedwagon Sticks, Foreigner. Ooh, these bands are on, you know, and we're in the front row now. Got a little money here in the front row. Have you noticed the front row smells different now that people my age can afford it? <laughs> when I was a kid, the front row smelled like marijuana. Now the front row smells like Ben Gay and Lost Hope. <laughs> You got your drink on, you roll with the changes, keep on. Uh, you notice when you got your drink on, you can bend your knees a long way, it doesn't even hurt. You're way down here, roll with the changes. Next day your knees wake you up, good morning. <laughs> you remember us, yeah, you tore us up bad last night. You roll with the changes, today you roll with a wheelchair. <laughs> I bought one of these, a chair and a half. You can Google this, it's a thing, chair and a half. If you and your spouse both get in there, get your wine on, get your Netflix, things are good. I don't know your spouse, you might need a chair and three quarters, I'm not sure. <laughs> We're sitting in the chair, things are going good. I'm writing songs to her. I'm on the road all the time, so I write songs, and they're corny songs because I miss my wife, so I'm sitting in a hotel somewhere writing a song, and I publish the songs, and I send them to her. I put them on iTunes. It's on, you can go to your Alexa and say, Alexa, play songs by Kevin Honeycutt. I will sing in your kitchen. Don't pay money for my music, it's not that good. <laughs> but I have music because I want kids to see Old Man Honeycutt's got songs. Where's your stuff? You talk a good game, I don't see your music. Mm. So when are you gonna start publishing? Where's, when's your book coming out? Well, I want them to put it out there. They're putting puberty out there, would you agree? I think today's kids are raising themselves on digital playgrounds and nobody is on recess duty. That's gotta be us. Whether we like it or not, it's gotta be us, right? I'm not gonna blame a kid for falling off a slide I don't even know about. So we gotta be there. So I'm in these places and I'm not good at any of this stuff. So I write this song for my wife on the road and I, look, I crowdsourced it. I went on Twitter and asked 65,000 teachers worldwide, can you help me with this? See, I'm smart, but my network is brilliant. They say the smartest person in the room is the room. How big is your room when we're not here today? Tomorrow, how many people do you have in your back pocket? I have 65,000. So if I say, does anyone have any free software I can use on a Chromebook for early literacy? I got it in five minutes because I'm connected. I want you to be connected like this. I want your kids to be connected like this, right? I need the help. Really. So I crowdsourced this song. I'm not going to do the song to you. I'm just going to flip past it real quick and go to the next slide. So this is what happened. Everything's going fine. My kid moved out. He's got a job. And yes, that's the look. That's the look right there. That's it right there. Yeah. Uh-huh. Right? She comes in with that stick and I'm like, what? I thought she was joking. I thought she found the stick from the first time, you know? I'm like, is this a joke? She said, this is not a joke. We're back in the game. <laughs> Look at her face. She's happy about this. <laughs> We're back in the game. She said it with two syllables, game, you know, game. I said, I wasn't aware I had eligibility. <laughs> this is my life. I mean, God did this to me. God did this to me. I know he did. He's sitting up there, he's going, this guy's gonna be talking about raising digital kids. I think he needs a fresh one. <laughs> When you got a little kid, you're on the ground a lot, you know? At my age, if I'm on the ground, an ambulance is coming, probably, you know? Just to get on the ground is a process at my age. You gotta think about how you're getting down there, how you're getting back up. I see Jesus like three times on the way down, you know, just trying to get down there. What's the smallest denomination of currency you will bend all the way down and pick up? It's a $5 bill for me, it's a $5 bill. $1 bill? Are you kidding? Chiropractor costs more than that. I just kick a $1 bill to a Jedi. Hey, Jedi, have a one, you know? That's it, man. So that's my kid. That's my kid. So what do you want to be for Halloween? Ceiling fan. <laughs> 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 
We had another unicorn. He's coming to your class. How will you teach him? He's got nine robots, two programmable. He's doing just simple MIT open courseware coding. Uh, I, we're just starting small because there's only four. Um, <laughs> So he's got nine robots, right? He's already doing programming um, and designing apps, and he just—he's crazy. And he's coming to your class, and I'm thinking, when he goes to school, how are you going to teach him? Because he's already here, right? What are you going to add to that, or how are you going to unleash him? I don't want anyone to slow him down, right? And he doesn't know any of this stuff is hard. He's just a weirdo, right? And so where do you want to be this Halloween? This Halloween, he wanted to be a lawn sprinkler. <laughs> That's a sprinkler head. Anyone have these in your yard? So this, this lit up, it lit up, right? So it came out, so I can you go. <laughs> That's my kid. So my wife, there's the two boys together at the top right. By the way, he looks exactly like his brother at the same age. It was like that egg sat in that ovary, just aging to perfection. And finally it went, oh dang, it's almost too late. And it came out and he's an old soul. You have kids like that, you say, oh, she's an old soul. Uh, there's research on this, by the way, moms. Did you know that when your kid is in your uterus, you swap brain cells with them? Some of your brain cells are in their brain, some of their brain cells are in your brain. Is that crazy? There's research on this. You know what? I think when you say old soul, what you're really saying is an experienced kid who has some of mom's brain. Now, maybe not specific memories, but some things. I think it's how we pass down wisdom. And this is very recent research. This kid is like an old soul. He's smart at two, at two, right? We go through the drive-thru, Arby's, you know? And I, I always get screwed at the drive-thru. You know, we get to the rest area to eat, and my sandwich isn't in the freaking bag 50 miles later. <laughs> Always happens to me. So I said to him, he's two, can I have one of your chicken fingers? He said, nah. Nah, I got all righteous, you know. You, you mean to tell me the guy who bought? He said, dad, calm down. I did not eat your sandwich. <laughs> I looked at my wife and said, uh-oh, we better be woke. You know what I mean? <laughs> so my kid went to college and I bought a Camaro because it's my turn. You get to that part of your life and you've paid your bills. It's your turn. You know, I'm a teacher, but now I bought a Camaro because what? It's my turn. I'm spending the inheritance. I had this, but then we had that, and now I drive that. <laughs> I'm back in the minivan again. I'm back. You know, t ball. I did t ball, man. T ball is hard. You gotta love your kid to do some t ball. And them aren't good bleachers. That's the worst bleachers in the district for t ball. You get up and your butt looks like a whopper. You got the flame bro marks, you know. <laughs> You're listening to Frozen again, you know, in the minivan, the headrest, you got the DVD player, you're like, I'm gonna kill somebody, right? <laughs> so here he is, right? How am I gonna raise this little dude? I could raise him like a 1930s paper boy and no one would blame me. They'd be like, it's an old man, I understand. Why is that honey cut child so unemployable? Oh, his dad's that old man. Poor kid. Raised him uh, on 80s music. It was always the 80s in his minivan. Poor kid never had a chance. So I'm challenged, I'm back in the game. God has invited me back and said, you need to learn again. And as a teacher, I didn't mean to stop. You just get tired. I think there's some days you step off the bus and let them go. You don't even know you're doing it, right? And your kids are all waving, you're like, uh-oh. Right? Some years can go by before you realize, ah, I think I, I got behind here. So you come to a conference like this to get back up there again, to get your skills sharpened up again. I could raise them like this, have you seen this? I call it the digital pacifier. You see parents all the time, hey, shut up, here's my phone. Hey, shut up, here's my phone. That, that's dangerous, right? That's real YouTube. Two clicks later, she sees a beheading. It was all cute a minute ago, it was blippy, and now she sees a beheading because I wasn't watching. Moms and dads, we gotta be there. The worst thing I can tell you, we have to be there with our kids. And the best thing I can tell you, we get to be there with our kids. But I need to know what they do, right? So I'm, I'm trying to keep up as best I can at 53, and it's not the year of the car, it's the miles on the chassis. I'm tired, man, <laughs> right? I want him to have success and happiness and to be able to chase his dreams. But this one is like me. See that thing on his head? See, he's Owlette. Anyone know PJ Masks? I should do. PJ Masks, it's a PJ Masks. He made that hat. That's underwear on his head, man. <laughs> this is my kid, man. He crazy. My wife said, this one's like you. I think he's got ADHD. I said, I think so too. So here's what I say to kids. Hey kid, you have ADHD or automatic divergent harmonious discernment. What's up? I invented that. And by the way, it's not a lie. Automatic divergent harmonious discernment. What does that even mean? I can think of more than one thing at a time. Can you? I can think of three things at a time. Can you? I can't think of less than 10 things at a time. See, I have the same closet with you and all the clothes, same one you have, but nothing's on a hanger. It's all on the floor. 
So I make new outfits, new combinations, because I don't know. I just pick them up and go. It's not bad news. So I can tell kids, you have a mind that can have more than one idea at a time. That's actually a superpower, I think. By the way, I want you to steal this slide because I'm trying to get people to see this is not a disability. This is my ADHD, right? This is what it looks like in class. Hey, Kevin, here's three worksheets. Memorize these shapes for the quiz. Cool, I will. I can see all three pages at the same time, right? I see it all. I see through it some ways, right? So this one girl, she says, I saw a circle, a triangle, and a triangle. She doesn't have ADHD. She got A. I said, I saw this. If you look at all three pages at the same time, are all those things there? They're there. I got an F. I saw more than she did. I saw more than the teacher did. And I got an F? Why did I get an F? My brain can see more. You understand? This is not a bad thing. But if I teach the way I always taught, that kid never gets their day, right? In a problem-solving situation, in a blended learning situation, that kid is a rock star. But if we teach the same way in rows, right? In rows. And I hate this. We have rows still, you know? You go in a classroom that's rows. We know that's the worst way to learn. We've always known that. It's called the custodial arrangement of teaching. Designed so a custodian could get a broom between the chairs. It was never designed. It was never designed for optimal learning. We know this. I've been on 5,000 planes in my career. Have I memorized the pre-flight speech? No. You know why? I'm row. No, I'm 26D next to the restroom. I can smell the restroom from here, right? And there's how many heads between me and the person talking? And plus, she's pedantic. Womp, 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 womp. Rescue it. Womp, womp, womp. Exit. Womp, womp. Whatever. I, you know, I didn't remember. So we have new tools now, right? So back row kids can act like front row kids. There's research on where you sit. Did you know? Some of you got here early, you sit up here. Some of you got here early, so you can sit back there. I showered, I smell good. <laughs> I'm worthy of front row, but you don't know it yet. That's okay, that's my job, to get you to want to be up here. I gotta hook you and cook you, hook you and cook you. Zing! <laughs> I'm gonna get you up here. I'm gonna find a tool to get you up here. I'm looking every day. I'm a pharmacist, I'm a Walgreens. I'm gonna find your thing. There's a million of them out there. Now how do I find them? I'm connected to 65,000 teachers, right? I'm not smart, I'm connected. So that's what I do. So I had this teacher yell at me in Louisiana. They just went Chromebooks. They went one-to-one -one Chromebooks like that week. And that, this teacher who's obviously mad about this, she's in the back, 700 teachers. She screams during the keynote, I hate Chromebooks. <laughs> what do you do? I mean, do you, do you talk to her? Do you give her the floor? Is it dangerous? I took her on. Why do you hate Chromebooks? I don't know what the kids in the back of my room are doing. I said, get up. <laughs> This don't have to be hard. Kids pass paper notes. We didn't ban paper. Retire if you like your chair that much, you know? It happens to all of us. In a teaching career, so you get tired. You do. Remember when you got your first good chair? Any of you people with gray in your hair? You know when you ordered your first chair that you ordered? You sit on that thing and go, that first time, oh, man. Secret lover. It's like a Ford Probe or something. This is a good chair. And you sit there and you think, do I still get up or do they come to me? Maybe they come to me, I'll snap them over. Because I like the chair. Some teachers want to get up, but they like their chair. They get one with wheels and roll around like a sand crab. You know? <laughs> Look, wherever I'm standing is the front row. So if I'm standing next to you, this is the front row. And if I'm standing next to you, this is the front row. Wherever I go. So pollinate every flower five times an hour. Get up. I gained 30 pounds sitting down. I sat down. I didn't mean to. I got tired. It's hard. This is a hard job. I know. But I got to move around, all right? If the technology can be a front row seat, because research calls the people in the front, the kids in the front, policy makers. They're doing okay on your test. They know somehow that being near the instruction is important. The kids in the back, there's a name for them, my friends. <laughs> <laughs> they call those kids bystanders. Don't bother me and I won't bother you. I'll take my C or D. We don't have to make a thing out of this. And they do that. So this is what I don't want. I don't want you to be able to hide behind her. The first week of school, you'll keep doing this. And then you get tired. And before long, you just let her be there and she'll get her D or C, right? So I gotta make sure I can see every kid, whatever that means. If it's technology, yes. If it's the way I do my, I scratch the wax. Yes, I scratch the wax. This room had been the same when I took my job for 30 years. Divots in the floor from the rows. And I, I moved them around. The janitor said, you scratch the wax. I said, no, yeah, I moved the things around because this is my room. Don't make a janitor mad. It's a bad, that's a bad mistake, right? <laughs> I set my room up on the round so I can see every kid and I offset the chairs so no one can hide behind anyone and no one has worse than a third row seat. And I just move around the best I can. And use the technology the best you can, right? Here's what I think happens. She says the colors are blue, yellow, and red. And she's right in her way. I said I saw blue, yellow, red, white. White, Kevin, yes, the paper, what's up? <laughs> you don't see the rectangle that is the paper? Shouldn't that be on the quiz? 
Well, where does the orange come from? The combination of the two triangles in that hexagon there, the near perfect black for a combination of all three colors, I get an F. What? I just want some instruction to cater to my skills, you know? For it to be a little bit out of control so that I can be the rock star in your room. So if you're, in, if you're always in trouble because things are too noisy, good, you know? I got written up for that. Teacher, the principal, a superintendent came in and he said, these kids are not on task. <laughs> task. I said, what do you mean? Well, they're all doing different things. I said, yeah, they all learn different ways. This is blended learning. Remember you sent us to the workshop? <laughs> Were you not ready for me to actually do what you showed me? I got written up because he didn't even know how to see what I did. What? Oh my gosh. Sometimes I feel like a preacher, like especially in Texas, I get like, amen, Brother Kevin. <laughs> So kids with ADHD come to school, and it's not always that they have to have ADHD for this to be the problem. That figure on the figure A is an interference pattern. It's the data that you're giving to your kids, and it's all mixed up because they can't put it together. It's just floating around like this, and they get fatigued. They burn through all their brain-based glucose by 10 a.m. just trying to pull this together. That's language, that's math, that's all things. If there's some way for them to put them together, to see them together, and I think problem solving helps with this, especially open-ended problem solving. So I can show you what I can do, you know what I mean? If you're good with that sometimes, can we find time? And people say, Kevin, I want to, but there's no time. I've got to cover content. What if we uncover some content? Have you ever gotten to the last chapter of the book anyway? The last 10 minutes of class, that's your jewel right there, right? That's when the kids, the kids have to pee in the pool. Look, have you seen this? Kids swimming, suddenly you can tell they stopped and they're peeing in the pool. <laughs> last 10 minutes of class, they're done anyway. Some of you got that look now, it's the beginning of the day. I don't know what to do. And that's when I pull out like a right now learning challenge. So I say, kids, okay, everyone stop and look at me. Okay, last 10 minutes of class, I want you to go to the Google Doc right there. And I want you to tell me everything you can tell me about the brown recluse spider. Cite your sources or I delete your post. Do you feel me? You have three minutes. Always create a time shortage. If they think they got 10, oh, they'll be screwing around. Yeah. I'll give them three. They really have 10, don't tell them that. You got three, it's not enough time. You're wasting it, crap. And I'm in control of that laptop. I'm in control of that iPad. I say, I say shark them. Shark them. Bring it down to three quarters and look at me, I want your attention. But Mr. Honeycutt, I can multitask. Raise your hand if you're a multitasker. Raise your hand, raise your hand, own it, own it. None of you are, okay? <laughs> this is Stanford research. Humans are not multitaskers, we are fast switchers. I'm gonna prove it to you exactly now, but some of you don't believe me. Let's do a little thought experiment, right? I want you to draw a circle with your left hand. Draw a circle. This is driving a car. If it's a perfect circle, you're a perfect driver, rock on. If it becomes an oval, you cross the center line. <laughs> now, research would say, oh, you're attending to. You're attending to driving. Nicely done. Stop. Right hand, draw a triangle. This is texting and talking on the cell phone. Texting and talking on the cell phone. Stop. Drive. Now text while driving, you multitaskers. <laughs> How's that working for you? Pretty good, yeah? Your brain is weird. Have you ever driven all the way to your house, got to your driveway and realized you don't remember any of the drive? Yeah. That's your brain. Here's what your brain does. Hey, let's make a deal. I'm gonna, I'm gonna shunt driving down to level two awareness and if a deer jumps out, I'll wake you up with a shot of adrenaline, cool? You go back to lesson planning, is that good? And that's what your brain does. Your, your brain protects you from boring, literally. Because we would die if we got used to boring and we were okay with it. Let me explain. 35,000 years ago, one of your one of your ancestors, an upper Paleolithic hunter-gatherer, wakes up in the morning thirsty. You know why? Last night, his wife made woolly mammoth. It was a little dry. He didn't say nothing. But he's like really thirsty now. He's never been thirsty at 5 a.m. So he gets up and goes down to the water hole at 5 a.m. Never been down there before. Goes to get a drink of water and looks up on the ridge and there's a saber-toothed tiger and he goes, Rah! And he goes, Mugga, you mugga, Because we were prelingual at the time. <laughs> and his brain takes a snapshot of everything. Never drink water when sun is low on ridge. For the rest of his life, he remembers that. This happens to us too, right? Emotion crystallizes learning. Stick with me for a minute. Remember 9-11? How much do you remember about that? Whenever something emotional happens, this happens, historians will tell you, it's always been true. Humans snapshot everything adjacent. The day of your marriage? Birth of your first child? So if instruction isn't memorable, if it's not the deer that jumps out and causes the adrenaline, they're not gonna remember the drive home. Your instruction is to drive home. So it's crazy. How many times an hour can you make a deer jump out? How many times? You see, see, there, see? She's like, I think phlegm flew out. I think I hit it with phlegm. That's not moose, sweetie. That's phlegm. I'm so sorry. I had a chemistry teacher. Any chemistry teachers in the room? Chemistry teachers are crazy. He takes out lithium with tongs. Lithium is a very unstable. And it's dripping fire. There's fire. 
and every drop makes a fire. So he's walking slowly like he didn't notice. And we're like, fire, fire, fire. We're all going, oh my God, we're going to die. <laughs> Apparently he did this every year. You pay attention in chemistry class, right? Because the deer jumps out. Right? So I don't get a deer to jump out. That's what I'm thinking about. How do I do that so that some of these kids that are used to that can have a good day? This is me about five weeks ago in Franklin County, Tennessee. That's my old house. I roll up on this trailer park where I used to live, right? That's Chandler's trailer park. I went to school in Pelham, Tennessee. I'm that kid that was there for like, I don't know, a winter. There's four working outlets in the house, no working lights in the ceiling, 275 per month rent. When I roll up, I want to take a picture of my old house. How many times do you guys spray paint 16 on a place before you know it's number 16? <laughs> Someone likes some spray paint. <laughs> anyway, I roll up, I want to take a picture of the house, and she's standing there in the doorway in her bra and panties. I can't take a picture, that'd be porn, right? <laughs> so I walked up, it's awkward. I'm like, hi, can you honor me by putting on a shirt? <laughs> and she did. So what am I doing in Franklin County, Tennessee? We're doing a three-year grant to bring families back to school. See, for some families, coming to school is like going to Auschwitz after you survived the Holocaust. Crimes were committed. And so trying to get them back and involved in their kids' life is not an easy task. Some of the silly things we do, we do big cardboard events. So all this cardboard, and we're making X-Wing fighters and, and Darth Vader's and, and R2-D2's and boats and submarines. That's what we're doing. And what happens is no one's afraid of cardboard, no one's afraid of duct tape. So grandma comes, and grandpa comes, and mom comes, and the teachers are working right alongside the parents, and they don't even know you're a teacher. And by the time you're done, they love you, and now they know you're a teacher, and they're not afraid anymore. Sometimes we literally have to have these in a church because they won't come to school. Gyms are usually okay. They'll usually come to a gym, but if we don't get numbers, we do it at a church because that's neutral ground. Is that crazy that we have to do that? To get moms and dads interested again, to get them back to school. So I want every kid to have this front row seat. So my whole life turned one year sitting in the, in the back of the class. My dad drowned that year in a drinking accident at the lake. We were partying with bikers. We weren't. I was babysitting my father again. I'm 16, and I got to watch my dad, always. He's really cruel that night, so I just left. I left early, and he drowned. And my family blamed me for abandoning dad. It was my fault. So I'm sitting in the back of the room. I'm a statistic. I'm gonna be back in the trailer park. I know it. I'm beating my head against the wall, literally just kind of going boom, boom, center block ball, boom, numbing out, I'll call it numbing out. And my brain hit the side of the, the pickle hit the side of the jar, and I saw my own future. I had a little flash forward my own future. There I am in my single white trailer. My kids don't have shoes. The fridge has beer and mayonnaise and I'm my dad. And I got scared and I said, no, no, no. I got up and I went to the front of the room and I sat in the front and my life changed here this day in the front. Here's what I found out. Teachers ask front row kids more questions. I think it's proximity, right? And it's embarrassing if you don't know answers. So I'm looking around and asking, why is she smart? Why is she smart? Why are they all smarter than me? Why am I stupid? And then I realized that this is not, this is a code and I didn't know the code. Here's the code. The next right answer in the lecture is always the next dark black word in the book. Someone should tell you that, really. I started testing my theory. I'd go to the next dark black word, put my finger on it, and raise my hand. I raised my hand, right? And Mr. Parker said, the action potential has bridged the synapse, gone down the dendrites, across the cell body or soma, down the axon via the myelin sheath and the nose of Ranvier, and to the terminal bulbs. What happens next in the cognitive process is the question. Still remember the question. I raised my hand. He called on me incredulous, honey, come. <laughs> like, like I couldn't raise my hand, honey, come. <clears throat> I said, um, excitatory or inhibitory neurotransmitters are then released into the synapse. He said, honey, <laughs> He gave me one of those. It hit me like crack cocaine. I was like, <laughs> <laughs> You ever see a kid so proud for a second they're goofy and they don't know it? They're <laughs> I just need some stuff. Just now I need some stuff. Well, I got addicted to that, that kind of crack. So I came to school early. I memorized the dark black words in every class. It wasn't that hard. For the next three years, I got all A's and one B. I was D's and F's freshman year. All A's and one B. I wasn't stupid, I was in the wrong chair. How do we give every kid a front row seat? I'm just thinking about it all the time. If I can hook you, I can cook you, and I'm working on it. And then some teachers, they struggle. You ever have a teacher tell you they don't like a kid? I don't like her. I don't like her. She's in eighth grade. If this is an emergency room, would you act that way? You broke your leg, why don't you sit down and think about what you did? <laughs> it's not my job to judge. Fix the leg, man, that's our job, right? Find a way to get a splint on that thing and fix that leg if you can. I got like 40 hours more stuff and I don't know how much time. This is one of my kids, that's Bill. He poops bigger than I am. <laughs> he's one of those kids, right? He's scary, he's the hurt leader, you know? On parole for violent crimes and theft when I meet him. 
Now, when I have a kid like this in my class, I try to find their kindergarten yearbook picture, Xerox it, and put it on the seating chart. So when I look at him and I look down, I go, oh, this girl. And you probably do this too. I take the scariest kid in class and treat him like he's the only one I trust. Come here, Bill. What do you need? Oh, this is a tough room this year, man. You got my back? Come again. You got my back? Yeah. And what did I just do? I cleaned his slate. Do I know who he is? Yes, I know who he is. You know how it is. If you, if you treat him like you know, he'll act like last year. If you want something different, you got to do something different. You know? And people try to tell you, let me tell you about that one. Shut up. Because he'll see on my face I know, and he'll quit. She'll quit. They won't. So I treat him like that. He helps me very loud. Do you, do you have this kid? Shut up! <laughs> Mr. H is trying to instruct in here. <laughs> instruct. He pulled out instruct. Allow me a little fricative. I'm like, dang, that. So he's like, you're helping me now. He's like right there all the time, up in their grill. And you know, he comes to my house to get homework help. He's big and scary. My wife's like, how many are you bringing home? I'm like, girl, as an elementary teacher, I said, you have lice how many times? <laughs> Point your finger at me. When I'm home, I don't check her for ticks, I check her for lice, you know? Because she hugs them all, yeah, even the scary ones. She had a little sociopath kindergartner about five years ago. And I wish I was kidding. He's been in so many foster homes, he's never bonded with a human. He's a great little kid. He'll hug you, and you turn around, and he'll stab you in the back with scissors. He went in the bathroom and wrote F-U-C-K a hundred times with a fat Sharpie marker. Hey, he could spell. He needs some better vocabulary, probably. My wife comes home and says, this is what she says, I'm going to find a way to love this one. That's my wife. You know? That's how she saved me. You know, she takes those kids. Somehow she becomes the lint trap, and she, she loves them. So that's this kid, right? I hire him. He wants to paint for me. He, this is third generation welfare, right? No one's ever worked in their memory, and he wants to paint for me. I paint in the summer to support my teaching habit. <laughs> so I'm up on my ladder. I'm just one guy. You know, I charge $10 an hour. I'm the guy that's always in demand because I don't charge very much. I just go out there and scrape and paint. He's, he's on my ladder. He's 350. He, he weighs 350 pounds. My ladders are rated to 200 pounds. So he's on my ladder, and I'm like, lawsuit, lawsuit, lawsuit. He's scraping in the hot Kansas sun, and I'm just like, he's going to do a day of work. This will be a victory. About 10 o'clock in the morning, he's done. <laughs> Sucks! Freaking hot, I'm done, I'm leaving. I said, have a nice walk. What? I said, that truck doesn't leave here to the end of the work day. Damn. <laughs> he goes and lays under the tree in the shade. And I think, maybe it's just hot. So I got the hose. <laughs> and I hosed him down, you know? And he went, boom, boom, oh. He climbed back up the ladder. I'm over here just acting like I don't see anything, you know? Climbs up the ladder and starts working again. And he finished the day. He, on the way home, we went, he said, can we go to Dairy Queen and get a crunch cone? I said, son, we can get a crunch cone. And we ate with a spoon, got the ice cream headache, and celebrated his first day of work. He finished the week. He finished the month. He finished the summer. He started his own painting company and competed with me the next year. <laughs> he went to Hush Junior College and got his associate's degree in graphic design and got a J-O-B. Right. Yeah, that's the uncommon core, you know? We have these stories, right? Yours are as good as mine. I want you to put yours down somewhere. You've got these kids that took off. You ever see a kid, they're in their 30s, and they see you in the store, and they run up on you? You don't know if they're going to hug you or hit you, so you keep, keep, keep the card in between until you know, you know? They still call you Mr. or Mrs., you know? Yeah. There's the respect there that's kind of beautiful. We can leverage that respect. I think you can flip a kid like you flip a house. Think about it. Notice the value that no one else noticed. Shore up the foundation. Invest in daily improvements and watch the value rise. Raise your hand if you think that's possible. I think, yeah, that's right. I think you can flip a teacher, a tired, blamed, marginalized, burned out teacher by noticing them again. I want us to notice each other again. I, just, I want us to be a family around kids, a bunch of, a bunch of family, right? And I want us to be a bunch of specialists who share a common parking lot. I want us to be a family that shares a common mission, you know? I always had the hard kids. And there were some teachers that had none of the hard kids. I don't know if you've seen these people, they have no caseload at all. I had 20 all the time. I feel like I'm breastfeeding 20 kids. You know? I get tired, you know? It's not milk, that's blood coming out of there, you know? I've got nothing left. And I'm like, take a, take a few. Take a caseload. They're all our children. We should do this, right? I hope so. This kid comes to school with a lighter. I'm talking to my friend, Jim Spoiler. Do you guys know who Jim Spoiler is? You seen Paper Tigers? Are you doing trauma work? Trauma informed? Okay, we got some things we can talk about, right? Trauma informed. Well, Bill, uh, um, Jim teaches at a school in Walla Walla, Washington. He's the, he's the principal there, too. And he's got a relationship with this young man who brings a lighter to school. He's lighting the lighter in class. So the teacher says, Give me the lighter. The kid says, F you. Uh oh. Go to the office. He goes to the office. Jim's there. Jim says, Hey, 
to just give me the ladder and everything will be cool. This doesn't have to be a big deal. F you, Mr. Spoiler. Uh oh. Out of school suspension, right? He needs more home time. What does Jim do? The opposite, right? He just sits there for 30 minutes with the kid. Just sits there until the kid opens up. 30 minutes, it takes 30 minutes. He finally says, he says, uh, Mr. Spoiler, yesterday when I went home, uh, my mom had moved without me. All I have left from her is this lighter. Ask him. They don't want me bad. Ask him, right? What, what if you don't have time? Look, if you don't stop the bleeding, you're not gonna teach anyway, right? So why not build that relationship? And I got in trouble for this all the time. I got in trouble for this because people didn't understand the importance of relationships. So I write this book. That's my book there, right? You point your phone at that and open up your camera. That QR code takes you to Amazon. I'm not trying to sell you a book. I'll give it to you for free. I want you to read it with your kids and then let me Skype in and talk to them about my book because it's the chapters of my childhood and every chapter ends with, and this is what I learned. And this is what I learned. This is why I was different. I didn't repeat those mistakes. I studied them closely and didn't be my father. I role modeled my mom. She was the stuff, right there. She had the right stuff. My dad hated me for that. I don't care. I always tell people, sometimes you can judge the quality of a person by the quality of the people who don't like them. <laughs> In other words, if Hitler hates you, you're doing fine. Now, I'm done at 9.45, is that correct, 9.45? Okay, cool, I'm just glad I got a little more time. I hope you guys are glad too. So I did this crazy thing. The secretary at my school, Dorothy Anderson, would send me notes every day. She sent me these little notes every day. I'm the only kid in class that got mail. This is one of them. I'm 53, it's still in my bag. And she would predict that I was going to be amazing. And she would say, I can't wait to be in your audience. I can't wait to be your fan. I can't wait to, and she would send them with her perfume. So I never lost these. This is all I had. Moving all the time, you don't get heirlooms, but I had these. And uh, it's like she ordered me off a menu, you know? I'm the only kid that got mail. And I would sit there with them. When dad comes home at two in the morning, he's calling me names and a faggot and a loser. I would get out the box with these. And I, I would just think that she believed in me. So I decided to believe her. So when I went to college with my learning disabilities, oh, by the way, I have dyslexia, I call it lexdixia. Doesn't that make sense? <laughs> it's hard to learn. I had to read everything three times to get a C plus. If I got a C minus, I'm back in the trailer park. So I'm hanging in there like grim death. Well, freshman year, I'm back in the town where she was from. And I saw her in Safeway and she saw me and she said, Kevin Honeycutt, I saw you in the Ottawa Herald, son. You going to college? I said, yes, I am. She said, son, I am so proud of you. She said, I know your life. While you're in school, you come to my house and eat out of my fridge. You are my son. How do you say thank you for that? Her belief became mine. So recently I asked 46,000 teachers worldwide if anyone had ever said anything to them that changed their life, and we put them all in one Google Doc. And if you scan that Google Doc, you'll have 110 positive belief statements that you can print off, sign, and give your kids when they're circling in the bowl. At the door, when you shake their hand, they take it out of your hand and walk into the hall and cry. I swear to God, they'll be 53 and they'll still have your note, right? So I crowdsourced that. I'd like to think that I have a million ideas. I have some, but I have friends. Right? So if you want this, the last slide of this presentation is gonna be one slide that has everything I talked about and 40 hours more I didn't have time to talk about. You'll have it all, don't worry. Right? So I'm gonna jump ahead here. I'm looking at the clock and I'm running out of time. I have so many things I'll do in my breakout sessions um, and it's a repeat so you don't have to come to every one of them. I'll do it over and over again. But I'm gonna jump out of this thing and sh tell you a little story, okay? <laughs> Back to eighth grade. Eighth grade, because poor kids have dreams too, right? But we don't always get our dreams to happen. But I was in eighth grade and I'd been asking for a guitar my whole life. And my dad would say, Poor kids don't get guitars, stop asking, you make me feel bad. Finally, eighth grade year, my dad found a, yard, uh, a guitar at a yard sale for one dollar with no strings attached. It had no strings. <laughs> so, so I opened it up and I'm like, Dad, cool, but without strings, it's really kind of furniture, right? I said, Shut up, don't, don't complain, you're lucky to have some fine, I guess so. So for three months, I had just the guitar with no strings. So I just made up my own song. This is my first song I ever made up at Christmas when I got strings. This is my first song. This is the first song I ever wrote. Is it good? That's the whole thing. Pretty good. <laughs> I was so proud of myself. I saw a poster in the junior high on the hallway that said, talent show, sign up. I'm like, okay, I will. So I signed up for the talent show with this one song. It was my turn. 1,700 kids in the audience, highly understanding junior high kids. She said, Kevin Honeycrest, thank you. Check this out. I start my song. Kids are cool at first. They think I might do more things than this. <laughs> when they realize it's all I got, they start to boo. When they started to boo, I just freaked out. I just kept going faster and faster and faster and faster and faster. And, faster. and the counselor came over and said, Kevin, you're done. I said, no, I'm almost to the bridge. 
She said, no, musically, you've crossed the bridge, son. You were done. She took me backstage where it hit me like a ton of bricks. Oh, my God. I just humiliated myself in front of everyone. I admit I had a dream and failed. They're going to hate me tomorrow. My life sucks. And I hated the guitar. I blame the guitar. Stupid guitar. I hate you, guitar. The guitar would talk to me because I have an active fantasy life. You need to meet my team of therapists. <laughs> It would say, you must learn to play me. I said, shut up, you must learn to play me. So finally, I just picked it up every night and I would just do stuff. This is like, this is the first chords I ever invented. I didn't know they were chords. This is G, C, D. So we go. I didn't know any of those things had names, right? The, the chords. But this one here, one day I'm, do, I'm hitting this one. And I tripped over this one. OMG. It over and over and over. It took me forever to find this one. Finally, I found G. This took me 11 hours to figure out about here. talent show the next year. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The my job as a teacher is to help kids blow up, to help them be bigger than they are until they are, to find ways to make them bigger. And I get kids who want to sing, they want to be in a band, but they don't have any friends. I can give them a band with this foot pedal down here. I bring this little foot pedal, okay? So I step on this. First, let me just sing a little piece of music here. Well, I've been running down the road, trying to loosen my load. I've been sailing away with my mind. I've been teaching guitar for a long time. And what occurs to me is when you learn guitar, anyone play a stringed instrument in here? When you learn guitar, you gotta push down even though it hurts. Then until you get your, your calluses and then you're fine. And I think there are calluses and blisters between kids and lots of things. And we don't always we don't always see that, right? So when I was learning to play guitar, I wanted the blisters over fast, so I just pushed down hard and went, oh, 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 oh. I call it the cheese grater. <laughs> but guess what? I had calluses in a week. I get through pain. I try to get through pain. So I, I teach kids, and I try to teach kids to play guitar. In my career, I probably taught guitar for 25 years, and I'm not good. I still can't read music. I'm not Juilliard, right? But I'll get a kid started. I'll teach them three chords and get them started. So I'm really interested in what we can do with technology to kind of do something about the blisters that kids have. So for years, I've been using phones, iPhones, right? And apps on the iPad to teach kids music, especially chords, like on a guitar. So I'm going to show you a couple of these apps that I use now to help kids get started when they might not want to. So this is Pocket Guitar. It's the fretboard, right? Now listen here. Now we can sell around with a manicure. I do a G here. A little clock first, ready? Looking back. No blisters. Now, if I, teach you three, if I teach you three chords on here, they work on that. This is not a game. This is real. This is real chord structures. Now, maybe kids aren't ready for that. But Shiny, I don't want to learn chord structures. Can I just play chords? Yes, you can. It's called I Shred. I S H R E D. And I can just put a song on here. Let's put in something by ACDC. Yeah. Turn it up a little bit. You gotta get in the stands, right? You're like, now tell them, A, 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 two, three, D, D, G, two, three. A. <laughs> oh my gosh, right? That's cheating. Not enough regular there. <laughs> Not regular, what you need. This one called uh, Ocarina turns your phone into a woodwind instrument. Just blow here. So I'm 
vertical. I was playing for you just now. I was also broadcasting worldwide just now. Anyone with this app could have heard me and sent me love. No one's ever sent me love. <laughs> if you hear Amazing Grace Done Badly, it's me, okay? That's called Ocarina, and most kids can just play it, right? Four, four little dots there. This is called Voice Band. Turn my voice into the instrument. Whatever I hum, I'm a guitar, I'm a synthesizer. 499, kids can be writing songs in the school bus, right? So I'm gonna open this up and put it on my phone. What if it's creating the most powerful learning tools in human history, right? I think the way the technology prepares a buffet of learning tools, and for the most part, we're eating the napkins. We should be doing more things, right? Doing bigger things, challenging kids to be amazing. Do I have any music teachers in the room? Show me a music teacher. Do I have a music teacher in the room? Yeah, can I borrow you? Can you come up here? Clap for her and get her to come up here. Here. Oh, that was so good. Oh, God, you would love that one. Oh, that's good, too. Oh, that was good. Uh, I always prepare 40 hours just in case. Uh, this, oh, she's good. Okay, okay. Closing slide. Here's me running through the house in my diaper. I had a pair of tweezers. See, they got two prongs. And I saw those things on the wall with two holes. I'm gifted. What's up? <laughs> Explains a lot, doesn't it? That's one-to-one -one correspondence. Two and two. I walked up to plug it in. My mom saw the whole thing, but she couldn't get there fast enough. She ran in and kicked me with love. She's like, no! <laughs> it's too late. I closed the circuit. That's 110 volts, man. That'll knock you back. Fireball flew out of the wall, man. My fingers are black. The wall is black. My diaper's full. <laughs> I didn't think about that for a long time until I got a little older, a little wiser. A little boy. Uh-oh. He's going to stick tweezers in the wall. And my job is to grow up beside him on that digital playground. And that's why you're here. 
to do that with your kids. And I honor you for spending heartbeats getting better at your craft. I love you for that. Thank you for listening. Here's the slide. It's going to have everything I talked about and every app I talked about and 40 hours more I didn't talk about, okay? Scan that and you got it. Thank you guys so much. Thank you, Kevin. I appreciate it.